I've got the uh, opportunity this afternoon to uh, interview uh, Levi Tilleman. Levi is the Jeff and Kyle Leonard Fellow at the New uh, America Foundation, and we are going to talk about his book, a uh, copy of which is right here, The Great Race. And I found it a really fascinating read, and uh, of course I want to get into the background about how it all came about and what he learned and what we can learn. If you haven't read it yet, I certainly recommend it. Uh, first of all, so uh, Levi, welcome to EV World. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me on the show. It's, uh, it's great to have you, uh, have you here with us. Let's begin, first of all, by, I, I think the thing that really got pulled me into the book was the story of your father and the Iris engine. Uh, so maybe uh, sort of recount uh, for the people who will be watching this, how that brought you to, uh, to some of the conclusions you reach regarding the future of electric vehicles. Well, I grew up in a very unconventional family, and my father was a very creative guy. He was an inventor, and we had a habit of starting companies together. We started companies that were generally based around some invention that usually it was my dad's idea originally, but then he would bring it to us, we'd bat the idea back and forth, figure out what was wrong with it, what was right with it, hmm. and how we could make it work. And then we would start to build a business plan around it, and we would go out and get investors, and we'd start a company. And the last company that we started was based on something called the Internally Radiating Impulse Structure, or IRIS engine. Okay. And it was a compact, powerful engine design that was meant to be dramatically more efficient than the internal combustion engines we use today. And so my dad and I were working together on this for quite a while. Um, and then one day while he was driving through the mountains of Colorado, which is where I grew up, um, his, his minivan malfunctioned and he got in a car accident and unfortunately he didn't make it. And so mm. I, I became CEO of the company and I needed more investors. I needed a customer. And so I yeah. went out and I started pitching this to you know, investors, but also to auto companies. One day I walked into the offices of Ford Motor Company. And their head of product development listened to the pitch. And when we were finished, he was very intrigued by the design. But he told me that what he needed right now was not a more efficient internal combustion engine. They already had a technology called EcoBoost right. that was kind of baked into their product development cycle for the next 10 or 15 years. What they were looking for was a better battery. Because mm. he said that the whole world was going electric in the next couple decades. Yeah. And that that was the future of transportation. And that really shocked me. And, and that's how I got into electric cars. <laughs> and so the time frame for this was what, late 2000s? Or? Yeah, this was 2009. 2009, okay. So that then led, of course, that was a uh, wake-up call that, oops, uh, these guys are thinking beyond the internal combustion engine and looking for uh, something that would be viable in the next 10 years or whatever then. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, so you began to sit down and start, well, where did you begin your, your research to do this book? What was the impetus? What was sort of the wake up call beyond that? Well, so before that, I'd been looking at competitors to our design. And one competitor, of course, was the battery, but I didn't take the battery very seriously until I started to hear the same thing from automotive manufacturer after automotive manufacturer. And then I started to wonder why they could be so certain that the future was in batteries. And I realized it was because in a few key regulatory environments, there were long-term strategic policy roadmaps that pointed towards a future of electrification. And most importantly, the state of California yeah. had a very you know, methodical timeline that they had laid out that showed automakers how many electric vehicles they were going to have to produce when and really set the stage for this, you know, dramatic change in the nature of our transportation system. Well, that I think that's the interesting thing is that the California Air Resources Board or what we refer to as CARB um, 
really began to, to lead this way. And of course, if you look at any of the history, it really goes back into the 1950s, actually late mm -hmm. 40s, and, and uh, trying to figure out how we deal with pollu air, uh, you know, air pollution. I happen to have spent a year on a sabbatical in Southern California in 1977 to 1978. Uh, How was the air quality? Oh, I tell you what, the air quality sucked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were day, there were we were out in Arcadia. In fact, I was I lived in a housing development right behind the Santa Anita racetrack, and yeah. so I so I wasn't that far from the mountains. Uh, and there were days when I would get up and my lungs burnt, my eyes watered, and I could not see the mountains five miles away. Yeah, um, you know and, I. So I used to work for I used to work for another author named Daniel Jurgen at a company called IHS, and he also grew up in L.A. Yeah. And when I was working on this topic, you know, it's funny because Dan, his industry is is really the oil it's industry. All oil. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's his that's his forte. Um, but Dan remembers it too. When he was growing up in L.A., he said it stung your lungs and it hurt your eyes, yeah. and it was just really a miserable situation. Right, so they had to do something about it, and back, and I forget the exact time frame uh, when they formed the uh, when they formed CARB, but uh, they began to lay out this this roadmap, as you say, and of course that's that's kind of where I came into the picture because I started getting interested right around the uh, mid part of 1997, which is they had just started rolling out electric cars out there, and uh, that's how I began sort of my involvement with this. But I got to say, after reading the book, I felt like I was new to this whole thing again. I mean, yeah, I was there in the mix of some of these very events that were happening, but there was so much that was going on behind the scenes, if you will, that, uh, that, that, that what you came across was really revelatory, even for me. Um, so, so how did you, you know, coming from kind of the outside, how did you sort of get behind the scenes on a lot of these things. Well, I, I really appreciate those comments. It was a lot of work, and there are a lot of different ways that I try to understand what happened over the course of the history of a certain industry when I dig into it. Of course, one way is to look at contemporary newspaper accounts and magazine articles and see what the press is saying. But another way is to find people like yourself and interview them and try to get their personal experiences of what was happening behind the scenes. And so I did a lot of interviews with people like Dan Sperling, people like right. Mary Nichols, right. who are very much involved in the industry, and also with people from the auto industry um, and people from the energy industry. And I tried to understand how they were experiencing the events and then cross-check that with what was in the official record or the first draft of history that you see in the media. And so I, I do all of that, and then I, I would try to bring it together and synthesize it and cross-check it best that I could and come up with something that approximates reality. Right. Well, let, let's not leave people with the impression that this is about all, all that just happened in California, United States, because you really do take a, a cross-nation view with this thing and focusing specifically on, as I see it, three countries. Uh, the United States, of course, um, because of the impetus that the regulations in CARB spurring on the car makers and leading to the development of the EV1 and, and that whole history. And then, of course, Japan, um, which, you know, really jumped in and introduced the first hybrids and again. And then China. Now, um, and you were able, it seems to me, to sort of get, I don't know where you got, were able to dig this up, but it was fascinating, um, you know, getting some of the personalities and the people that were driving the the EV movement, for want of a better term, in those in those countries. Here in the United States, you make a phone call, you go to a conference, you meet somebody, but doing that in Japan and China, I see that's a little bit more daunting. <laughs> well, it helps that I speak Chinese and Japanese, oh, but it still okay. it takes, <laughs> um, but it takes a lot of shoe leather. And yeah. you really, you have to go there and you have to find people who are willing to give you the time of day. And then they introduce you to the person who they think is important. And then he introduces you to the person that he thinks is important. Right. And at the end of the day, you kind of have to make a judgment on who the critical players were. And I, I would say that generally there's agreement. This individual that I talk a lot about, the nuclear engineer, Takafumi Anagawa, right. who worked for the Tokyo Electric Power Company, 
everybody, when you say his name, they kind of nod and they say, oh, Anagawa-san, because yeah. he was the yeah. guy. You know, yeah. He was the person who was really passionate about this and brought it through a, you know, kind of a desert that, that you know, could have really killed the EV movement for a period there. Right, right. Well, I found also what was interesting was the, uh, the history of uh, Toyota and Nissan and, you know, Honda uh, and how they were vying for various... I had no idea that, that the Japanese government basically wanted to quash Honda. I mean, that was, that, was, oh, yeah. that was interesting in and by itself. Look, one of the things I did notice, though, is I didn't find a lot of emphasis on Europe here. Um, at mm -hmm. least it doesn't stick in my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued with this you know, development going back. You know, one chapter I'm in Japan, another chapter I'm in China, and so on. But I didn't see a lot there with Europe. Well, what's sort of your, your view on that? Why, didn't, why don't they play a larger role in this? There are a couple of reasons. I mean, the first was just a practical reason, which is today, if you take Japan, China, and the United States, you have over 50% of global automotive production. And so by focusing on those three largest automotive economies in the world, you could get a really good cross-section of what was happening in the industry. Now, the other side of it is that Europe was really pretty far behind the game on electrification. The United States and Japan were far ahead of the Europeans, who were focused much more on diesels, um, right. They weren't even very interested in hybrid vehicles right. until, I would say, you know, the mid to late 2000s, the Germans finally started to yeah. come around on some light hybrid technology. And now, now they're converted. Um, I spent a good part of the last month with an i8, and it's a phenomenal car. Oh, some people criticize you. it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. How, uh, how, how is it getting it? You're probably young and nimble. It can get in and out of that car. I found it really hard to get in and out of. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have to go to the gym for a week, so that was terrific. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But uh, it was so much fun. Yeah. I mean, the, the car is, it is light, it is nimble, it has terrific acceleration, and it is just the most gorgeous machine that you'll see on the streets. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a very practical car, but to me, it's a revolutionary car because it has so many technologies integrated into it that are going to be critical to the next generation of fuel-efficient or electric vehicles manufactured yeah. by BMW. Yeah. And that's you know, the carbon fiber, that's the light weighting in various other forms like the you know, ultralight chemically treated windshield and, and, and back windshield. Um, that's the, the hybrid systems and, and all of those things that, that BMW put a lot of money into yeah. um, when they were developing this vehicle. And, and those are going to stay with us for decades to come. Yeah. Well, well good for you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you got a chance to drive that. Um, one of the things I found that, that you are not shy about expressing your, your view of the, uh, for want of a better term, stalemate of politics in the United States. Um, I, I, I almost get the sense that, you know, you're, you're, you're really kind of frustrated with what's going on within the, uh, the U.S. government in some respect in this race. Uh, is, has, has that view changed any since you published the book or, uh, and sort of, you know, where do you see us going? Are we going to be able to, to win this race or are we going to, I'd say we in terms of, you know, being a U.S. citizen, uh, win this race or are we going to, uh, you know, find ourselves being, you know, beat out by the, you know, the Japanese or the Germans or, you know, the Chinese? Well, these should not be partisan issues. And California has really carried the mantle on innovation for the United States auto industry for the better part of 50 years now. And so, you know, when I look at things, I say, why do we have one party that doesn't want to support America moving towards the frontier of automotive technology and doesn't want to support us in, you know, squeezing carbon out of the transportation system and getting off of oil. And, you know, I, I, I guess I'm a Democrat. I worked for the Obama administration, but okay. I see no reason why a Republican can't get behind this as well. And there are some Republicans. Um, Senator Dorgan actually has been very interested in electrification and, and has supported uh, some organizations such as Securing America's Future Energy, which right. is a nonpartisan group that right. has been 
uh, working with a diverse group of stakeholders to push an electrification agenda. But, you know, I, I think this is the kind of issue, both electrification and also um, laying the groundwork for autonomous vehicles, where we really should be able to bring both sides of the aisle together and work together to put in place the policy incentives that will allow America to stay globally competitive in this race and also to, to make real progress on the critical issue of global warming.